Today, I want to talk about leaves or fruit. And, and I want to talk about the presence of fruit in the Christian life. Does your walk with Christ produce those characteristics necessary to Christ-likeness? The true measure of being full of the Holy Spirit is the production of the fruit of the Spirit in our Christian lives and hearts. If we were to look back over the various series of sermons I've preached in the last couple of years, we would discover that really I was preaching one series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And in order, I've preached series uh, of sermons on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, and most recently, self-control. And I want us to notice what... So scripture says in Galatians 5, I'll be reading verses uh, 22 and 23 out of Galatians 5. And, and it says this, But the spiritual nature produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, f goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are no laws against things like that. And and there we see the last several uh sermon series and topics. And and I, I want us to notice, and it says the spiritual nature produces, it's literally talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And, and it, it says that the fruit of the Spirit is. And the real question is what is being produced in your life? Is it the fruit of the Spirit or is it the works of the flesh? And you can read about the works of the flesh a little earlier on in, in Galatians chapter 5. And, and I submit to you that if you are full of God's Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit should be there in abundance. And, and I think that's important. I, I think, you know, when we talk about, if we want to talk about Pentecostalism, charismaticism, uh, all those phrases that have been used to describe people who want to embrace the full activity of the Holy Spirit. And what we really want to come back to is a reminder of people who believe that all that the Holy Spirit gives is for today is that the true measure of Pentecostalism must be the presence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, in church history, that has not always been the case. It often seems that uh, in, in the struggle and the strife of the church, the fruit of the Holy Spirit has been missing. And, and that is of great concern. Now, if we just look over church history, we could go right back to the New Testament and see the church of Corinth. And, and we can tell by Paul's writings to the church of Corinth that they weren't a model church. They weren't really, they were, the, they were really a good example of a bad church. And, and, and we see that. They were divisive. They had sexual immorality present in the church. They were involved in a lot of other things. In fact, if you were to just read through uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians in one sitting and just try to read through and note all the things that Paul corrects, you will find that there were 78 different things that they had been doing that a healthy church shouldn't do. And yet they were abundant in the gifts. And, and that pattern can often be <coughs> repeated in the church. And it can be repeated in individuals. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the gifts. We should. Uh, if the Holy Spirit is dispensing gifts, they should be, they should be there in the church according to Scripture, and, and, and we want to accept that. But we want to remember the measure of what is Spirit-filled is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the gifts. And the measure of maturity as a Christian is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the gifts. And so we, we want to catch that. Now, when Paul writes about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he ends the discussion, verse 31. So you'll see that. It's 1 Corinthians 12, 31. And he says this, You only want the better gifts, but I will show you the best thing to do. 
And this, of course, introduces 1 Corinthians 13. And we want to remember that all those chapter and verse markings weren't a part of the original manuscripts of Scripture. They were added later just for the convenience of location and knowing where to find things. And so if we were, to, if this, we were reading it in, in its original format as a letter to the church, there wouldn't be that strong break between verse 31 that says, you only look for the best gifts, but I'll show you a better way, and, and the next one, and, and, and starting with verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13. So if I could just read it as a flowing statement, we would, it would read like this. <clears throat> you only want the better gifts, but I will show you the best thing to do. I may speak in the languages of humans and, the, and of angels, but if I do not have love, I'm a loud gong or a clashing cymbal. I may have the gift to speak what God has revealed, and I may understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. I may even have enough faith to move mountains, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. I may even give away all that I have and give up my body to be burned, but if I don't have love, none of these things will help me. And you see how that flows. Now, don't miss the point. Just one aspect of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is better than the gifts. That's what's being taught here. That when he says, you search the best gifts, but I'll show you a better way. And he takes one fruit of the Holy Spirit, and he, he says it's better than the gifts. And he uses those examples. He uses examples of speaking in tongues and examples of, um, of prophecy and understanding mysteries, which is discernment and having a gift, a word of knowledge. And yet in all that, he says, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. And, and we begin to realize that what he's teaching them, and he's addressing a church that's very Pentecostal, what it would call itself, if it was a contemporary church day, it would view itself as very charismatic, very spirit-filled, very active in spirit. Even Some might even call it prophetic. And he would say, your problem is the fruit of the Spirit is missing. Your problem is that the gifts are so important to you that you've forgotten how to act like Christians. And in fact, I've been looking at some uh, documentaries lately on the Normans and, and uh, how they developed in history. And they, they came over from Normandy, France. Of course, originally they were descended from uh, uh, Vikings. And, and uh, they went over and in 1066 they conquered Hastings and and, and the, the, the Duke of Normandy became the King of England also, and he had two realms and, and that whole process. But here's what you learn about their history. They, they converted to Christianity because the King of France wasn't going to allow them to have rulership if they didn't. Uh, but, but here's what happened. They became really good churchmen, but they were very bad Christians. And they were building churches everywhere and killing people everywhere. That's pretty much what happened. And I thought about that as I was watching that, and I thought, that's the problem of the absence of the fruit of the Spirit. Without a truly converted life, there's no fruit of the Spirit. And that's what Paul is addressing in Galatians 5. If your life is truly being converted in the kingdom, the fruit of the Spirit is going to start manifesting itself in your life. If that's missing... There's not a real conversion taking place. And the problem with a lot of people is they become good churchmen. They become good church people, but they forget to be good Christians. And the fruit of the Spirit has qualities that leaves don't have. And that brings us kind of to the title, uh, you know, leaves or fruit. That, that uh, the fruit of the Spirit is different than just leaves. And I want you to just imagine with me or think in terms of leaves are a, look like life and they're a symbol of life. And the gifts in the, in the church can look like life. They can be leaves on a tree. But, but the fruit identifies the health of the tree. And the fruit identifies what's coming out of the tree and all these kinds of things. And so I was just noticing some things about fruit and what it does. And, and I want to see that analogy when we think about the fruit of the Spirit. 
Fruit is food for others. Now, that's the first thing we notice. That, and and we, we get that, and, and, and you know, we, we learn to pick fruit, and, and we eat it, and, and it's food for others. And it's, you know, fruit is kind of like nature's dessert. It's sweeter, and it's pleasant, and it's food for others. And, and, and that's what fruit is. The next thing we see about fruit is fruit is nutrition for the seed that's planted. And, and that's the nature of fruit, that in the fruit, if you think in terms of an apple, there are apple seeds in the, in the apple. And if the apple falls to the ground, as it, as it begins to rot and decompose, that rotting apple it becomes fertilizer for the seed. It's food for the seed that's planted. And when we think about what that means in terms of the fruit of the Spirit, that the fruit of the... Now, the fruit of the Spirit doesn't rot, but the fruit of the Spirit fertilizes or feeds or gives strength to the gospel seed, the gospel message. When we think about witnessing to people and sharing our faith and trying to lead people to Jesus, we have to remember that without the fruit of the Spirit, there's no food for that seed to grow. In fact, that the, the, in church history and in, in some people have witnessed in their own lifetimes even that the, there are there, that people who are good churchmen but bad Christians are the opposite of food for the seed. They're detracting from the seed. They're attacking the gospel with how they live. And when a Christian learns to live within the fruit of the Spirit and to manifest that fruit in their lives, they're always feeding the gospel message in other people's lives. And it, it reminds me of a story I, I had come across years ago, a true story of one of our churches in, in a larger urban area and, and um, some some Korean people had moved into the neighborhood near the church and, and all this was happening and, and in the process, the the one one man in the church, he kind of became the man that the church was making responsible to reach that people group. And and the, the, the point was, hey, we have these Korean neighbors, well, a lot of them around the church. We should be reaching out to them. And so this one man said, I'll, I'll take it on. And he began to go around and he began to meet all the all the Korean uh, people in the neighborhood of their church, and he began to befriend them. And if they needed some help, he'd find a way of solving their problems. And, and maybe he'd bring food, or he'd find a young man to mow their lawn, or he'd help people move in, or whatever it was. He, he displayed active kindness in the lives of those people. And, and this went on for a while, and what, we, what do we see? Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And, and he did this. And finally, when he felt he could communicate well enough, uh, he began to talk to one of the men about Jesus. And as he's trying to tell the man about Jesus, his Korean friend said to him, is, is your Jesus anything like you? And of course, he said, you know, oh no, he's much better than me. And, and the Korean man says, I want you to understand if you're Jesus... Is anything like you, I will serve him. Because the fruit of the Spirit had fed the gospel. And, and so the other thing, fruit ensures the future of other fruit trees. Leaves don't do that. Every year leaves fall to the ground and nothing happens other than you have to rake them and clean them up. But, but when fruit falls to the ground, it ensures the future of that fruit tree and other fruit trees. It ensures the posterity of that fruit. And when we think about the fruit of the Spirit, it ensures the future of the church. The fruit of the Spirit ensures the future of the gospel message. It ensures that the church will continue to move forward. The other thing we notice is that there's a sweetness in fruit. I called it nature's dessert. There's a sweetness in fruit that satisfies. And, and leaves often taste bitter, but fruit tastes sweet. And, and we want to see that, you know, and I think about it right now because it's cobbler season and, and, and nobody wants leaf cobbler. I've, I made, uh, so far I've made raspberry, blackberry, blueberry, cherry cobblers for my family, and, and I'm, I'm running out of gas, but, but uh, nobody, nobody wants me to make blackberry leaf cobbler. They just want blackberry cobbler. 
because fruit is sweetness that satisfies the soul. And when we think of the fruit of the Spirit, there's a sweetness in the fruit of the Spirit that satisfies the souls of the wounded. And, and fruit also settles beyond dispute what kind of tree it is. And, and Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7, verses 15, starting with verse 15. Um, I'll read... Uh, it looks like I'm going to read down through verse 20. It says, Beware of false prophets. They come to you disguised as sheep, but in their hearts they are vicious wolves. You will know them by what they produce or their fruit. People don't pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, do they? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a rotten tree cannot produce good fruit. Any tree that fails to produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you will know them by what they produce. And I thought about that. The temple of the Holy Spirit will be known by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, don't you know that you're the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and in you he dwells? And I'll tell you right now, how you live with your body, with that fleshly temple, will display the fruit of the Holy Spirit if it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because in you he dwells. And if we're not seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in a lifestyle, then we know that that's not a temple of the Holy Spirit. And those are, that's a hard statement, and, and people might struggle with it, but it's a reality that we must accept from Scripture, that, that we know them by their fruit. And, and when, when someone is the temple of the Holy Spirit, they will be manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it brings us to this, this wonderful thing that we begin to know and understand, and that is that Jesus Christ is looking for fruit. And, and, and you have to think about that. When, when the Lord Jesus Christ is looking at a person or a church, he's not looking for gifts. He's looking for fruit. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't, Jesus Christ doesn't have to look for gifts because ultimately as they're coming from the Holy Spirit, those are gifts from God. And, and, and Jesus Christ isn't looking for those because he is God, but he's looking for fruit that manifests that his church has become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we see this example of the fig tree, which is always a representation of Israel. And if you want to go a little further, the fig tree is a representation of God's people. Because Paul talks about us as Gentiles being grafted in as, as a wild branch, and he uses the olive branch, but we are grafted into the same tree. And, and we begin to realize that, that this fig tree representation in, in this experience we're going to read about in Mark is a representation of God's people. And in Mark 11, uh, starting with verse 12, it says this, The next day when they left Bethany, Jesus became hungry. In the distance, he saw a fig tree with leaves, the sign of life. He went to see if he could find any figs on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard this. Now, the leaves gave the appearance that there is fruitfulness. And, and that is what happens with Christian lives and even churches, that they can have an appearance of fruitfulness without being fruitful. They can have an appearance of fruitfulness without any actual change in their life. They can, they can do the stuff of church without becoming conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And, and that's where we come back to. Some people learn how to become churchmen without becoming good Christians. And who and who and what do you want to be is the question. Do you want to be a good churchman or do you want to be a good Christian? Do you want to only have leaves or do you want to have fruit, which is what the Lord is looking for? And, and it brings us to that question, will Jesus find fruit? 
Will he, when, when Jesus Christ looks into the life of you as a Christian, will he find the fruit of the Holy Spirit there or just leaves? Will he find that you speak in tongues or do, will he find love in the depth of your heart? Will he find that you can prophesy or will he find love? Will he find that you can have a word of knowledge or will he find love? Because the Lord is looking for fruit. And I just want to close with reading what the fruit of the Spirit is again. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the spiritual nature produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are no laws against things like that. Now, my advice to you is to mark out those scriptures, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and start reading over the fruit of the Spirit. And as you do, pray over it and ask the Lord, Lord, put that in my life. Put that fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life, in Jesus' name. Let me close in prayer. Lord, I pray for all of us that you will move in our lives and that indeed, we will begin to manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we as individual temples of the Holy Spirit, as Christians, would begin to manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we would come to a place where we care more about the fruit of the Holy Spirit than the gifts of the Spirit, because you give the gifts in abundance, but we must be transformed to manifest the fruit. We know you're looking for fruit and not just leaves. And I just pray for that in Jesus' name. And I believe a church of people that begin to manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit will also function better in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you. Amen.